Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say it is going to rain, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. That was dramatic. I bet you're all just dying to both hear and at the same time dreading what I might say about Jesus' words in the first part of Luke's gospel lesson today, where Jesus said he didn't come to bring peace, but to bring division. After all, we call Jesus the Prince of Peace and recall those times when Jesus says to his disciples, peace be with you. I leave my peace with you. Peace be still. But today he says he brings fire and division and that he wishes the fire, that fire was already taking effect. But here we are. So I will cut to the chase. And in doing so, I am responding to an idea offered by Frank Logue, Bishop of Georgia who was someone I admire and follow both his writings and his stunning photography. In writing about this passage, Bishop Logue makes the distinction between true peace and keeping the peace. We keep the peace when we look the other way while wrongdoing is happening around us, in our families, in our communities, in our relationships, in the world. We don't want to upset people by telling the truth, by demanding honesty and integrity, by intervening in destructive behavior patterns that our family and friends or our priests or our teachers or our elected officials engage in that destroy the fabric of our society community, destroy families and people. Sometimes keeping the peace means pretending that there is no wrongdoing at all, a willful denial of reality. Keeping the peace might mean not telling about the affair of a spouse to save face or not telling about the cruel letter sent to the ailing rector to protect reputations. But keeping the peace allows an abuser to keep abusing, even destroying. Out of some misplaced loyalty and magical hope that somehow the victim is not really being damaged or destroyed, Jesus demands loyalty to God alone. True peace is not the absence of strife. It's knowing that we are joining in God's work of protecting the vulnerable and the lost and the grieving and the poor, even if it means upsetting someone, upsetting even someone you love, even your mother 
or your father or brother or sister or your priest or your warden. And so following Jesus can indeed bring division and indeed demands division when we are faced with the choice of telling the truth or keeping the peace, which is not the peace that Jesus wishes for his followers. He wishes for his followers a peace based on acknowledging reality, however hard it might be. Which leads me to the second part of Jesus' words today, in which he urges his followers to learn how to read the signs of the times. But first, a short story. The other night, I said to my husband, let's walk up the street to that restaurant for a quick dinner. The weather app says it's not going to rain again for a couple of hours. So off we go on our 10-minute walk. And five minutes in, Tom looks at the sky and says, I don't think we've got two hours. That sky looks ominous. And I, looking at the same sky, but wishing mightily for the tacos I've been thinking about all afternoon, said, oh no, It isn't going to rain yet. The weather app says we've got enough time. We had 30 minutes. And yes, we got wet on our eight minute walk back. And one of us was gracious enough not to say or not to say repeatedly, I told you so. I let wishful thinking cloud my judgment to the point that I ignored the reality around me and never considered other alternative options. If we are going to interpret the times, we have to be able to acknowledge the realities around us instead of engaging in wishful thinking. And during the present time in the life of the church, all of the church, and also this particular church of all saints, it is crucial that we attend to this. So thank you, Jesus, for bringing this up today. Most of us are aware that a major shift has occurred in the world around us. Things are not the way they used to be in many areas of life. Some of these changes are good, and we've rolled with them. But many of them have left us feeling lost. We are in a period of destabilization and disruption, both in the world and more to the point today in our church, which makes us very anxious. And the impulse in the time of anxiety is to do everything possible to just get back to normal, the way things used to be. Parishes in transition, like ours, are susceptible to wishful thinking, to experiencing a reality gap, ignoring the signs of the times around us. And these are the times. Christianity is not dead, but many of the ways in which we have practiced Christianity for the last few generations have run their course. All but a very few, usually very large, very well-resourced churches are in steep decline, both in membership and in financial resources. We have experienced that here. And as we prepare to begin the process of interviewing candidates for a new rector to lead this parish into the next season of its life, we are in danger of engaging in the kind of wishful, magical thinking that Jesus is warning us about. 
So let me tell you a truth. Lots of new families are not going to walk through the doors of this church just because we want them to. And the new families who do come and who have already come are not going to be just like we were, but will have different priorities, lead differently, and express spirituality differently. And the new rector is not going to reverse the decline or bring back all the people and all the things we loved from the past. And if we are secretly wishing that she or he is going to do that, if we are secretly hoping for a magical turnaround so that we can just say the same and never change, we are going to make things difficult for them and may even turn on them when they do not perform miracles. Their work is going to focus on leading us into a new future. And we have to accept the reality that we are a much smaller parish than we used to be, and I know that's hard and sad. But interpreting the times isn't about doom and gloom. Truly, being freed of trying to maintain old habits and carry around old baggage and continue to try to make bloated systems and processes work that don't work for us anymore gives us a wonderful opportunity to do something new and to have new life that will necessarily look very different from the life before, but it will be authentic life of following Jesus into the world, following Jesus. Resurrection is our brand, and we need to learn how to live into that again. As hard as it is to live through decline and even death, we don't get to resurrection any other way. Ignoring reality kneecaps the opportunity to grow into the new life that God is hoping for us. And what we need to and should always be about as followers of Jesus is new life. So we do not engage in hopelessness by seeing the realities. We give ourselves a chance to be transformed into a church community that can reflect the glory of God in ways we can't even imagine now. That's what being faithful means. But we have to be willing to let go and take a leap of faith into a new and as yet unknown future, trusting that God is good and faithful and true, and that in God there is always hope and always new life. So let me tell you this truth, too. Something new is wanting to be born here at All Saints. Because God is always doing new things. We can try to shape our future by planning and forecasting and strategizing, but in the end, it might be best for us to train our eyes outward toward what God is doing in the world and give ourselves over to wondering instead of striving and letting a new passion for God be born in this community, in response to God's life-giving ways. Does that feel scary? Of course it does. But as we heard Jesus say last week, do not fear, do not be afraid, little flock. 
For God wants to give you everything. So let's prepare for that by opening our minds, our hands, our habits, and our hearts to receive it.